what I know is going to be an interesting series of presentations and then a, and then a small roundtable discussion um, between our participants this evening on the topic uh, in, in the most general sense of uh, fabric, fabrication and architecture, um, which is coinciding with a wonderful exhibition next door uh, in, on, in the AA gallery called An Atlas of Fabrication which shows some of the current research and interests of, uh, of the architectural office, Barco Leibniger. <coughs> Frank Barco is here to my left, uh, is an ex-AA tutor who began a body of research and thinking here many years ago, in fact, in this building and with some installations that were out one summer, I can recall, in the, on the sidewalk outside, um, which began to interrogate and examine this question of how fabrication in architecture is changing in to a very great degree through the kinds of tools uh, and systems that architects and other designers work with. That will be our larger topic today, and the context of that will be, will be the work of Barco Leibinger uh, next door in the gallery. Um, Frank Barco, as I said, is a former tutor. His partner, Regina Leibinger, uh, is also an ex-AA tutor. You will, many of you, I think, will know both of them through their roles teaching and as external examiners here at the AA. Frank has invited in a few friends and collaborators to carry this conversation forward. To my right, Chris Bangle uh, from Munich has come over where he has been since 1992 director of design at BMW uh, and is in Munich with a studio there now um, and is a collaborator with Frank as both from both the client side and the design side uh, on some of the work that you'll see this evening. To Chris's right, Fabio Gramazio uh, is someone that many of you will have seen last year as part of the public program in a talk that he did with his partner here showing some of their work um, back in Zurich. Fabio is an assistant uh, professor of architecture and digital fabrication at the ETE Ha. Uh, and I think many of you will have seen their work on exhibition, I think probably most recently at the, at the Biennale in Venice perhaps, a very big, big machine stacking bricks and other things. Um, he'll show a bit of his work. And Michael Meredith to my left is joining us this evening from Cambridge, the more distant Cambridge in the United States, uh, Harvard University, where he is an associate professor at the Graduate School of Design. Um, and with Hillary Sample, a principal of MO Studio MOS Moss uh, there with, a, with a very much uh, an interest and uh, a body of work that again, circles the topic of fabrication and the relationship between output, production, and design today, and design cultures of all time, including architecture. Enough of an introduction for me. I'm going to hand over to Frank now. We have scripted the evening fairly loosely with the promise that each of the participants will first do a short presentation, about 10 minutes each, that will get some of the work out there on the table, and then we will have a discussion amongst ourselves on the issues that are raised and open that up to you all on the floor. So Frank Barco. Um, thanks, Brett, for the introduction. And uh, also thanks for the invitation for the exhibition. Uh, it's been, in a way, a really a fantastic way uh, to come back to the school to, and, and also I think in a way to conclude some of the things that, that we started here. Um, I'm also really super happy to have my co-participants uh, tonight. Been working with Chris in a client, but also teaching with Chris at Harvard last fall, so um, overlapping some of those topics. Uh, Fabio, I think we've been uh, overlapping in countless symposiums, but always keep missing each other. But in the last two years, have really been pulled together, I think, in terms of a sympathy of approach and what we're doing. Michael, we kept bump keep bumping into it at, at GSD. Uh, Michael's also so won the PS1 uh, MoMA competition for young architects this year, so um, I'm super happy to have him here also. Um, I just wanted to zoom through some of our work pretty quickly to explain it in the context of the exhibition and some of the things we're doing now, as well as some of the student work that overlaps uh, with some of the things we were doing with Chris. Um, this triangle, I think, sort of maps out a way. We didn't start uh, with this topic of fabrication to, to begin with in the office. We were a, a more or less conventional building practice and sort of brought this uh, uh, way of thinking or working into the office incrementally, but always like this idea of kind of research, uh, an academic approach and practice as, as sort of autonomous but overlapping um, ways of working uh, within the practice. Um, this idea of a search for an idea for an architectural prototype that emerges from the control of a technical system was really the question 
uh, that we put to task when we were teaching here at the AA in the late 90s. How could uh, a technology began to control uh, something like a, a prototype? So you're looking at a, a project from Jacqueline Yao of a, of a kind of template system for retaining walls. How uh, uh, tooling materials could start to inform the making uh, of an architecture. Having landed, you know, from the States, uh, I was teaching at Cornell in Rome and had remembered uh, a, a lecture. This was kind of the antidote that, that launched the project. Uh, Joseph Connors talking about uh, the spiral roof of San Ivo coming not from a history of painting or sculpture but coming from the invention of the wood lathe and this being um, uh, something that, 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 that was quite exciting uh, to us. Uh, so, so, so uh, you know, I think, I think about five or six years ago, we started to inventory machines. We've been working with Trumpf, which is a, a machine tool company located in Stuttgart. Um, but to, to sort of paraphrase, one of Brett's introductions was listening to what the machines were saying, inventorying, trying to understand capacity of machines, what they could do, and how they could inform the making of an architecture. First steps being very fundamental, uh, using software like scripting to produce uh, patterns. Uh, essentially two-dimensional systems, uh, understanding how those would work. Uh, this quickly evolved to, uh, I, I think we became, began more interested uh, in sur surface depth, how that could inform a project. And uh, I think probably in one of your pieces I was reading, this idea of, of, of doing things like architectural competitions or architectural work, already in a sense pre-informed by a, a kind of tectonic approach to architecture. Um, so that in this example for, for a project in um, Dresden, the, the design is actually a, a simply a choice of, of, of looking at all the historical propositions for a site in Dresden in this Baroque city, uh, compiling them into a composite uh, project, and then coming back and sort of reanimating that surface through uh, water cutting of a, of a stacked sandstone, uh, which is a typical uh, Baroque uh, material for, for Dresden. So this idea of both a kind of a very familiar approach to an architecture combined with an unfamiliar uh, uh, approach to uh, its rendering or, or exercise like simply um, f uh, finding out how something works. The idea of, of, of rolling off one meter uh, coal steel off of a band and then um, coiling and then foiling that back on itself uh, to produce a project like this. Certain architectural types, I think the uh, pavilion type has been an area of a sort of um, experimental leeway. We'll use that as a kind of project to, to test an idea or premise a structural. So that's, that's a kind of programmatic uh, um, area that seems to be repeating uh, over and over. And I think in a way you guys with, with your PS1 Long Island project will be very much in the same boat, I think, uh, uh, this, this spring. So that's been interesting. Um, as we, again, inventory machines, the machines are continually evolving. Uh, this machine is, uh, which is uh, pretty well staked out in the exhibition next door, uh, uh, tube cutting, uh, revolving cutting, uh, was an interesting premise in itself because I think the idea of, of working a three-dimensional <laughs> off-the-shelf uh, material, the tube steel, uh, that could produce uh, both a kind of efficiency in terms of harvesting multiple pieces from one piece um, and using that. So I, th I think there's certain characteristics, the idea of a kind of evoked nature uh, or, or um, a kind of decorative approach or ornamental to this. It seems to be a capacity of the machines to, uh, to produce this. So again, this was a kind of area in the office that at least in the beginning is independent from program or brief or, or even budget that we can uh, have enough uh, elusive to sort of see how these things can be uh, uh, evolved. Uh, the idea at the end of the day in, in our practice is that these things are archived and can, uh, again, sort of pulled out and used on particular projects. In this case, uh, the so-called Sweden facade project was for a showroom uh, where it's both sort of hovering between a functional uh, system as a sun protection screen for this building at the same time has a kind of moray or uh, ornamental uh, aspect to the project. So again, we're sort of archiving our own material that we can then re use later in projects that are happening in the practice. Uh, the architectural exhibition like it is here has been uh, for us a kind of ideal avenue um, for, for taking the kind of open-ended research work and focusing it into a more specific question in the uh, Be Venice Biennale Arsenal show, uh, so-called um, nomadic garden project. Um, we looked at a system uh, that could be organized as a kind of strong form uh, clustered 
uh, uh, garden that could then, in an interactive way, be uh, taken apart. So um, we'll look at things like this, um, you know, studies like particle uh, dynamics as a kind of diagram that might um, give us an idea of how you could colonize an installation as a site, and then at a later phase, think about you know something as abstract as this uh, having a sort of material transfer. So in a sense, the, 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 the pixel aspect of this is, 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 is looking at, and this gets com more complicated and complicated, but, but sort of assigning each one of those um, a physical material uh, that then is, in a sense, um, uh, works on this project, which is a, is a kind of like a peg port, the CNC cut base that these pieces fit into them. Um, at the show, it becomes this highly organized thing, and it becomes, I guess, what we call a kind of entropic mess, basically. Anybody can kind of move these things around, so it becomes um, kind of like a hairdo that comes apart by the end of the, the two or three month uh, uh, exhibition. So, um, and, and, and works, you know, sort of like this. People can come in and kind of move pieces around. So, so again, that, that seemed to be a vehicle. Um, another idea was this idea of backing into form. We'll take a, um, a material and tool it in a specific way, in this case, having a complex radius inherent and locked together um, as, a, as, a, as a way of working the material um, and, then, and then think about what forms those could produce. So uh, we like very much this idea of, of a kind of part to form uh, procedure where that can inform the making of these, these kinds of pieces which would be again a pavilion project for Frankfurt at the German Architecture uh, Museum but, but, but again sort of assigning a kind of status to those pieces that could be uh, a structural one. Um, a couple projects, two or three projects. Uh, in this, this sort of, you know, sound by, I think this was in, in Icon magazine a few months ago. Um, but, I mean, we would love to do Prada boutiques and we would love to do museums, but um, the idea with the technology also was a trickling down or a kind of letting this um, technology be accessible for us in everyday uh, kinds of building types and not uh, pulling, be becoming less and less of an exclusive way of working outside of the studio into a kind of everyday building practice, which is uh, where we're working. So um, quickly, uh, so th three projects that um, have been informed in a way by the, f the first half of the kind of research projects. Uh, the first project is a, a mid-rise office building in Seoul, Korea. And in the, uh, we often work contextually in Seoul, Korea. It was a complete uh, eight contextual site. Uh, and, and we liked things like this, these 70s buildings like uh, uh, Herr Cobb's, uh, Hancock Building, uh, which always wanted to be this perfectly flush, flat facade, uh, but they could not never get it. So we liked the idea of sort of doing this badly but intentionally. We even liked the sort of history of this building where, uh, if you remember, the windows sort of popping off of it. Before they popped off, they sort of slightly changed color and, you know, slightly altered so that um, these things interest. So, so, so we started, you know, working in the courtyard over through, you know, again, making this, you know, again, this kind of hold of the facade badly as sort of, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as an intentional way, in this case fabrication, to produce what we call more of a, a phenomenal effect rather than really being interested in the joinery and how things fit together, but it's really a kind of prop, I guess I would say, in the service of uh, producing this, this kind of effect or this kind of a surface. So. And, and again, I think paraphrasing Brett's uh, mention of Mies van der Rohe talking about uh, producing a mock-up of the building's actual materials to understand more precisely what those effects were. Um, I think, again, closing this gap between representat representation, drawing, and models, uh, uh, favoring uh, the prototype uh, as ultimately a much better way of, of predicting an architecture than, uh, again, relying on uh, drawings and models. I think there was, in our practice, there was a suspicion very early on on, on a computer simply or digital simply producing images and we became very quickly interested in it as a kind of guidance system. Um, so this is the project. Uh, um, again, we'll back up and use drawings to study um, um, limits of sizes, uh, pattern making, uh, uh, repetitiveness uh, versus variation in it. Uh, using, you know, fairly uh, few standards. We'll, you know, if we need to, we'll return to um, uh, analog models uh, to understand the John Lee. So, uh, which is, I guess is a way of saying um, it's not an exclusive system. It's not digital fabrication is going to do everything we do in a perfect way, but if we combine it to handcraft or 
um, analog system, uh, it's all legitimate. And I think we talked a little bit about that at lunch, that um, it's really about resourcing and exploiting um, resources as, as they come along rather than relying this as a kind of exclusive uh, system. And a lot of it has to do with sort of teaching yourself how to do it. This is uh, Gary from RUPS Hong Kong working with the crew in, in uh, Seoul in terms of putting together these, you know, you know, very, you know fairly complex uh, uh, sections uh, for the window systems. And then in this case, going back to the prototype one-to-one -one in terms of performance testing to see if it works, get client approval, and then go into production and producing these things. So sometimes it's a, I, I, I kind of visual or, or, or testing of it, sometimes it's a perf uh, performance testing. But again, somehow this being the link or the hinge pin and, and many of these kind of between the research aspect of the project and the actual execution uh, of the project, again, the, um, the idea of the, uh, uh, the effect of the phenomenal effect of this facade actually being the thing that we were really after and not so much concerned about the joinery or kind of fetish about that, but actually uh, how that would react to a completely unpredictable uh, context of, of this uh, sort of emerging city uh, uh, in Seoul and how, how this stuff uh, would, would work. Let's see. Uh, the window wa washers are insane. Um, uh, another, an another example is uh, for Trump, again, this is the company who's producing these machines that uh, we would produce a gatehouse for them uh, that would embody all the capabilities of their machines. So in a way, this building is, is, is very simple, a demonstration of what that did, w could do. We engineered this with Werner Sobeck. Um, so there was a kind of expression or, or a kind of radicalness, both in the structure and expressing uh, how that was worked. I mean, we were very interested in, 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 in revisiting a historical project, such as uh, Prouvé's work in the 40s and 50s. Uh, this is 1951 uh, gas station uh, in, at Vitra um, that did this, this idea of, of, of working with metal that in a way was, could, could take care of all building systems, the structure, the glazing systems, the furniture. And one of the questions was, well, what, what, what would happen if we revisited this project with the tools and capabilities we have uh, now and, uh, and and one of the sort of procedures or ways of working was appropriation. We looked at the company and we realized um, they can do laser cutting and uh, laser welding. And the question was, could we take um, a kind of process that they've established and scale that up to the scale uh, of, of a building? Um, so we would take things. Uh, we would inherit these kinds of drawings from Sobek's office. The kind of digital loading. Uh, which always sort of remain as these kind of interesting or compelling drawings, um, but, but really we're interested in making this kind of information uh, legible. So um, after a series of testing and testing, uh, we came up with uh, a model, which, and this is a 1 to 50 model, which is actually built how the actual roof was built. So again, somehow closing that gap again, but um, sort of reading that, that digital or loading information onto that surface so that the, the, the cassettes of this building uh, could, could uh, vary in response to that and then be backed up by other systems like this, such as, uh, as the lighting system, which is inserted into the sort of coffers of, of, of that roof. And then, and then going back again to the, to the prototype of the roof, which uh, explains all the fasteners and the gutter system and all these things again, as the kind of um, guidance system for going into uh, production uh, of the actual uh, project itself. Uh, again, if we need to, we'll com combine uh, different uh, craft levels, uh, in this case, uh, uh, an artisan or hand craftsman uh, producing these um, plexiglass uh, tube uh, inserts that fill into a kind of double glass facade um, and get fit in there. So it was also the idea of, of making a facade that was completely made uh, out of either glass or, or uh, plexiglass as a way of, of doing that. So again, there's a kind of, I think, moving around and using systems as, as needed to complete uh, the task uh, of the project. Uh, the last project was, is, is the Cantina project, uh, which you know, looked at, uh, again, looking at uh, natural systems of uh, organization, hierarchy. Uh, we began to... Um, produce models uh, that, that would produce a structural system between steel and wood, already thinking of a kind of material uh, application to this right away, 
uh, and then thinking of the sort of structural thickness as something that could filter a light as well as uh, controlling space. So this, this little sound bite above was really about producing these models and then um, accessing um, fabricators uh, right away that could start um, solving this project. Again, going back to the prototype in the shop in the Black Forest um, that would show the fasteners and the quality of the wood uh, at a scale of one to one. It even sort of uh, started to give us a sense of how this thing would even spatialize. So, um, so, it, so it, we could run artificial lighting through it, day lighting. So uh, it, was, it, it ended up being a highly, highly accurate way of, of anticipating uh, what you wanted to go into production. So these guys have these wood shops down there in the woods. They have millions of euros worth of software and hardware, redraw everything we have and, 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 and make these things work. But it's, uh, there's no precedent for this, so uh, they would just kind of do the numbers, draw everything, and then go into these huge kind of production runs in, in the factory, then pull these pieces on site, and then uh, uh, put them up. So this also meant, of course, uh, extremely uh, fast construction. Uh, the steel was up, these pieces, this sort of lattice system could be pushed up very, very quickly uh, through a very uh, simple fastening system. Sometimes it's simply dumbing things down uh, so you can do them uh, in, <laughs> in an easier uh, way that would produce, again, these, these kinds of, um, of spaces. Uh, again, I think this idea of spatializing or creating these <coughs> very strong in interiorities uh, through these um, secondary, uh, you'll see these in the show too, uh, tiles or something that uh, even though I knew in, in 19th century America this was a, a typical uh, sort of trade uh, that would find these things in Germany that you can produce custom terracotta tiles with custom colors that they would produce for you. So again, this kind of surfing around and, and finding systems that you could put uh, into the system. Um, for this, the, the, this final building. So, so in a way, this, this, this combining of the research to the, the, the building project has in a way been, for us, I think the ultimate test of what uh, the potential for this material is. Again, using the exhibition, the exhibition here to produce um, this piece, which I think is gonna end up over your desk or something, but, but um, to, to, to keep pushing. So we spent, in, in a way, the whole time of the, the exhibition getting prepared for that to um, find somebody who could do this piece and, and understanding through um, a new generation of scripting, how we could put the geometry to produce um, this, this, this kind of piece. Um, I, I had a few projects that I wanted to sort of dovetail with, with Chris's presentation. Uh, this is the work we did in the fall at Harvard. Uh, the question was a, was a pretty clear one. Um, we were looking at Chris's uh, technology uh, uh, for Gina, which is a, a fabric uh, over a frame. It's a kinetic surface. It's both performative as well as an aesthetic surface. Um, with this idea of, of design following technology, um, what could this mean for a, a, a studio, a design studio, question being suburban, uh, prototypical housing, and how they would react it. So, I mean, we really put it out as a, a question uh, to see how they might uh, take that on. So, uh, one example uh, from, from, from um, Nacho Galan was uh, a frame uh, system that could move, uh, that had a, a translucent or opaque skin that could adjust to it. Uh, that could move and adjust uh, to, to light, um, uh, both in a kind of asymmetrical condition, both in terms of spatializing those interiors or reacting to, to light. So um, I think uh, versus other projects that in a way I suppose were much more uh, utopian projects that worked on a kind of much larger infrastructure scale, um, this, this sort of mad project of spinning uh, hubs and uh, telescoping um, volume. So, um, because it was so open-ended, I think it was interesting for us in terms of the kinds of approaches uh, to the work. But uh, again, I think I think this, you know, still thinking of this idea of, of a particular tool and how that could inform uh, a, a, an area in architecture. Uh, in this case, a series of, of, of tracking points that produce a series of dome canopies uh, that later plugged into a, a Los Angeles uh, infrastructure uh, project. And I had a film, but I think this isn't still. So you had a series of elevators, infrastructure that were using um, air rights over uh, freeway, <laughs> freeways, and then would colonize those through a series of, 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 of residences on top of this uh, deck, um, which could, um, through a series of, of kind of membranes, uh, transform uh, through the spaces uh, through that. So, and this this one's for you, Chris. I think it, it's it's doing one of your car things. So. 
Um, <laughs> but um, so, so, so again, I, I, uh, that's the end of my presentation, so I think we can go to Chris, but just trying to illustrate some of these points, both the academic, the research, and, uh, and the practice, how these points are overlapping for us right now. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Can we just okay. pull this out? Uh, I don't know. Well, Michael's going to be my, my mouse monkey here. Okay. Okay, why – did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, while you're setting that up um, – that's really cool to see all that stuff again. I know. Yeah, and a lot of stuff I hadn't seen, so that's, that is cool. Um, the show is neat. Uh, I, you probably know I just left BMW after uh, over 16 years there, so uh, the presentation you're going to see is, is still a BMW presentation. I took out all their references to it. Um, uh, and it's about uh, actually uh, how we went to Gina and why we went to Gina and what we did afterwards because uh, if any of you know this, Carl, there's a little film clip of it. We worked on this alternative type of surfacing back in 99 to 2000. The actual car was done, uh, finished in February of 2001. So, uh, Michael, could you go ahead here? Yeah. Okay, um, just for your information, there is a tight relationship between architecture and cars. It's very interesting to me where architecture goes, cars follow. Uh, but really, cars have not looked correctly with architecture since about the time of the Victorian age here <laughs> of <laughs> architecture and cars, uh, which at that time, cars were made of wood, by the way. Um, how you make cars is, in fact, as uh, valid a point in what they look like as why you buy them. So when people ask, what's the next car going to look like, one of the crucial factors to ask is, how do you physically make it? Back then in this great age of very voluptuous cars, um, they were hand-welded up steel. Go on. And that gave us this incredible um, uh, dimension of difference that we grew up with knowing as cars because of the different shapes. Um, these cars are here practically all contemporaries, and that's something that's very unusual to see that amount of change. Go ahead. How we do cars classically, and you have to know a little bit of this to understand why Gina was such a dramatic change away from that. As probably architects, you, you don't work with uh, materials like this as much as we would in the car industry. This is a Rolls Royce being done here. This is done all in clay, and these cars are done by hand. Can you go ahead? We mill them as well, but they're all finished by hand, and much of the formwork is also done originally by hand. Um, the precision of clay modelers is about less than two-tenths of a millimeter over a five-meter length of car. So they're pretty accurate at what they do. And, uh, of course, we check it all in the computers. Uh, the final results that go down the pipeline into the tooling is coming from a computer, but it has all literally been sculpted by hand. And that's one of the, the critical things about this determinism that went into cars. Designers are there to determine what it looks like through the hands and the sculpting of the modelers. Go ahead. And you would think that this amount of dedication towards uh, the uniqueness of the sculpting act would in fact give us uh, an incredible variety of cars out there, but actually it's overridden enormously by how you physically make cars, the next piece. And that's why, for instance, you wind up, here's uh, five different cars and they look basically all identical. Um, you could ask yourself, why didn't these five car companies buy their doors from the same company at a certain point, if we're doing this so sculpturally? And, of course, we all know the results out in the world out there. We like to talk about the uniqueness of the vehicles, but in reality, as an industry, we've managed to proliferate. I think the next picture even shows it better. This sense of any color as long as it's silver, sameness out there, and uh, the financial aspects um, that limit change are so dramatic, the investment is so heavy, that it really becomes no question at all, once you're inside the industry, why things all look the same. The next picture, please. This is an interesting shot for uh, some of you, maybe. This entire room is necessary to make the hood of a Mini, okay? So when people say, oh, we'd like to change this, and uh, why don't we just pay for that? And, well, you can imagine how much money goes into retooling up uh, what's called a Pressstrasse. That means the hood goes through probably six different stamping form um, uh, processes before the final comes out. All that just to change a hood. So this is one of the reasons why cars work in these long cycles of seven years. It takes you that long to make the money out back on these things, et cetera. And this was a real frustration to us. And when we approached alternatives to it, we had in our mind not so much an end result of what it could look like, but actually a different way of approaching it from a, the physicality of making it. 
Right. So this is a little bit about the birth of Gina. Uh, we had, uh, BMW had a d has a daughter company called DesignWorks in California, and they work for a third party. And I had asked the product designers at the time, what would you do for a car? And one of them, Fernando Pardo, did a car. The next picture shows it quite well. He did a car basically, he covered it with almost like a nylon stocking. He put Mercedes wheels on it. I have no idea why. <coughs> it looks like it, doesn't it? I mean, really. Product guy, what do you want? Anyway, Fernando did a great job. But very interesting about it, he explained the car and he used the name Gina about it because he wanted to, to give a, a personality to it. He wanted the car to move. He wanted it when the car came into the garage at night, it would go <gasps> <gasps> and breathe. And I think the next picture you see, he wanted it to light from within, etc. And um, the interesting thing about it was to him, it was, it was a very fresh idea. To me, it really wasn't. In fact, the next picture, cloth cars have been around forever. Um, it's actually not a new idea at all to have uh, cloth vehicles. In fact, every truck out on the highway out there, at least in Europe, has got a cloth back on it. The Wright brothers flew in a cloth airplane, et cetera. Nothing really new in that. But next picture, there's a truck. You know, you know what these things look like, right? Um, but it had always been approached from this functional aspect. You know, we'll make the cars bigger and then smaller or something like this. There's a functional reason behind it. And he approached it, next one, please from an emotional aspect. He wanted this car to, to be as clothes fit on a person, to, to actually reveal and hide. And this whole emotionalization um, aspect into it was a completely new facet. And of course, cars live and die on emotions because they are like giant avatars out there for us. So um, we started out working with frames on cars. An interesting thing I found out later, the word in Italian for a space frame, for a space frame car, is called the telaio. It's well known. I'd known it for years. We would talk about the telaio. But the name telaio in Italian comes from tela, and that is cloth, and it was the original name for the weaving machines. So I thought it was a nice kind of 360 degrees coming back to that. So this is the original work done on Gina. Go ahead, next one where we began to cover a Z8, which is a performance car that was a complete space frame car. The entire physics of the car being carried by the space frame, the skin on a Z8 really doesn't do anything but the aesthetics and the aerodynamics. Go ahead. Began to skin it, and then uh, the resulting, keep going, um, uh, came with a very interesting uh, space frame underneath it. This car is called Gina Light, not because it's particularly lightweight, although it is, but because it only has a fraction of the content that we wanted to put into it. This is a prototype underneath. Oh, here's the Talayo shot, sorry. Um, instead of uh, how we would actually do it in manufacturing. So this is the car, and now there's a little film clip of it. Um, doing it, for those of you who haven't seen it, I cut down this film clip. I don't know, do we have audio? No, there's no audio, I, I just kind of sing. Oh, it's not showing up. Oh, wait a minute. Was it? Technical no, no. Put it on there. It's put it on and click. It's playing here, but it's not playing there. Oh, really? Well, you have to come over and look at it here then. Okay, let me explain this. What's happening yeah. is a kind of okay. It looks really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can I can try to describe it for you. Uh, it's going like this. Yeah, here. Can you guys see that? That's good. It. Okay. It's a little small. It's also on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube, uh, like big time. Are we actually doing this? Okay. I well, don't know what's. I'm sorry, I didn't. I okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, but should we go? It w it no, that's no, the fix that's still. The and this is still, I mean, I guess the, the whole beauty of it is in its. Uh, we could go out on this open stand. We could. Uh, Can you do that? Just jump out? Yeah. Because. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. That's kind of. That's <laughs> good thinking. Okay. Ready? Play. Come on. There we go. Okay, this is what you see on YouTube. There's a little bit of talk over from me in it. But it's interesting. There's no door cut in the front of the door. Look at this. It just wrinkles up. Yeah. And the car is one of the few cars that looks about as cool with the doors open as shut. When they close, the wrinkles go away. This is how you get at the engine. Very emotional, kind of <laughs> sexy, almost obscene. Um, when you sit on the car, the seats come up. The skin is transparent, lets the lights go through. Oh. Um, uh, the spoilers move on it. Uh, you can change the shapes of it like this. And the eyes have a very interesting kind of uh, almost, uh, you know, humanistic, <laughs> hi, aspect to them. Okay, thanks. That works. 
So if you go on YouTube and, and take a look at it, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. It does all its tricks on there. Um, but what was interesting to us was uh, lots of different facets about it which are new for the car business. One of them, of course, as I said, it gets rid of all things like door cuts and stuff, and suddenly the skin of a car becomes different. People ask me, is it safe? Well, all the safety is underneath by the space frame, and if somebody cuts this with a knife, I don't know, they, they, we have cabrios. People don't go around knifing cabrio tops. I guess they could do it. But it takes, it takes a, good, a good trained person about two and a half hours to skin the entire car. And I guarantee you, if somebody dorkied your car, you wouldn't get it repainted in two and a half hours. So, okay. Um, some of the things that we have lost in the car business, like the emotionalism of the plumbing under the hood, love all those chrome pipes, right? We won't have that in the future. We have to find other ways to emotionalize cars. And this way of accessing the engine is, well, pretty emotional. Um, spoiler moving up and down. I think if you click on it, Michael, you'll see the spoiler actually move. This or one? Just, just go, yeah, there oh you go. Yeah. You just advance to the next picture. Right? Yeah. It goes up and down, right? So we replace all kinds of wacky stuff like this. Um, okay, next picture. The interior. Now watch the instruments and, um, uh, yeah, watch it when he clicks on them. See how they turn towards the driver? This whole business of reorienting the car around the driver now can be done seamlessly. And if you're putting things together in a dynamic environment, you have to deal with a piece, in a piece, with a hinge, with a gap, with a, with a seal, with a dust, with a da-da-da-da, and a rattle, and a fit, and so on. And this gets rid of all that. You just let the material do it. And that was one of the real breakthroughs for us, in the, at least in the thinking process. The materials can do the talking. We don't define the forms. We let the materials do it, okay? Here's the transparency again. Next shot. Now, this is really interesting. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, we have come to assume that there is a personality in our cars. We look for it in the faces of them. Um, we get this idea behind it that somehow it's alive. We give cars names, all kinds of things like Mini, it's me, you know, that campaign, right? Next shot. I mean, we even, you know, Herbie, right, has this like inner spirit, right? So he's driving, okay? <laughs> When you are actually confronted with Gina, you are confronted with something which transcends that boundary of animate object, inanimate, its own will. And it begins to put into questions, where do we want in the future products to have their own will or not? Uh, when you see the next shot, which is just a quickie of the, uh, look up here at the headlights, it just does it by itself. You know, this idea that it winks at you and tells you things, it was for us very new. At the same time, it solves a lot of problems. If you ever tried to mount a headlight in a car and you knew how many issues were around that in terms of manufacturing, uh, you would say, wow, that's a pretty cool way of dealing with all those issues. Okay? Um, it, it went pop when I took this slide some time ago. It had four and a half million hits, which generally you only get with like rock stars and porno and stuff. But I mean, in the car business, we don't know it hit this. Now, why is this interesting? Perhaps for this audience, um, we have because you're young, I guess. No. Um, it's important that cars stay relevant to people, otherwise they won't buy them. And particularly, the, these people who are clicking on here are not people of my generation. They're the generation which right now cares the least about cars of any generation ever. But they somehow, this resonates with them. So that's something that, for an industry, we wanted to hook onto. Okay, where did we go beyond that? Real quick, here, surfacing was our big deal, of course. So we began to put surface in question. Keep going. All right. This is um, how we generally cover a clay car. It's covered with uh, stretch plastic, and it looks like a real car at the end. But then this car here was actually in the running for the 3 Series. This has never been shown before. And the board decided not to do it. It was a nice car. But what's interesting about it is, go to the next one, it's all Gina skin. All those surfaces are not defined by, by hand. They're just defined by the perimeter um, splines. And that was completely new for us, okay? So we went beyond it. We just clicked through these kind of quick. This, this is the origami work we did for this car. We, we decided that Gina could be applied as origami. Um, you notice this complex compound form is, in fact, folded out of a single sheet. More importantly, in the next one, it's hand-formed. And if we don't keep, the next picture, people in the loop, you know, what are we as designers? Somehow our job is not to make people unemployed. Our job is to make them somehow more productive. Okay, yeah, well this will be interesting. Okay, next one. Um, so we went beyond surfaces then, beyond Gina, real quick here, which is this love affair we have with perfection that comes from the boating industry, okay? This, in fact, the same type of, of uh, lofting work is done in cars, and uh, we do it in computers to the nth degree. So we asked ourselves, what happens if we get rid of that, okay? And we get rid of this idea of perfect surface and go to instead, here's a very simple model, 
not particularly unusual, but it, it is based on the idea of good surfacing. The other side of the model, however, is based on the idea of completely flat surface faceting. Mm. And what's fascinating about it, even though it's painted the same, it seems shinier, and flat faceted metal is stronger, therefore it can be thinner and lighter. You can just click through these. Mm. It was a very interesting first test. What could that be as a car? Keep going. I don't know. Maybe this. That would be kind of interesting. Then we began to look into sculpture and architecture. What are they telling us about surfacing? Keep going. How could this be a structure which immediately when you see it, you understand this is a part of a sustainable world because it's more efficient. It's not part of the old world. It's part of the new world. Some first research we did on it. Okay. And of course, that architecture is telling us surface is structure is where we want to wind up perhaps. And this is the first card that we did as a test as a student project. All the surfaces here are defined by the force actions on the car itself. That means every surface is a force line, okay? And it was a very, very interesting project, just student-wise, okay, just to get out of there. Basically, this is the old way that we've done cars, and uh, we all have it in our heads very romantically, but, go to the next one, but if architecture has taken us down roads and they have shown us where to go in the past and they show us where to go now, who knows, maybe cars will be more like this in the future. Okay, thanks, that was it. That was good. That was great. I'm going to try to be faster. Let's see. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to try to show three things, uh, really the three things that are unfinished. So um, the first, I, I feel ob ob somewhat obliged uh, to show, this is what you wanted me to show. PS1, um, we wa just want it. It's like showing a, a sketch. Essentially, it's changing, hopefully getting better. This is like two to three weeks worth of work because the idea came very late. And this is 99% of what we presented to them. I took out some of the budgeting stuff that's really banal. Let me see if I can. So as you guys know, I mean maybe, there's a pavilion every year at PS1. It's been going on for a long time. It's starting to get a little tedious, perhaps even. The I think um, our project was called After Party. How do I do this view thing? No, no other way. You know, I think it's Control L. I just <laughs> better with. Okay. I'm just going to show it really quickly and then move on to some other stuff. But I think I think right now we're in an interesting moment. And I think this kind of um, it's a bunch of cones, essentially radial structural surfaces. We looked at kind of at a combination of let's say uh, Felix Candela meets chimneys meets radial structure. I, I mean uh, spoke structures, let's say um, tent structures. Primitive huts, thatch. We were obsessed with the kind of thatch. It's not like this anymore. It's gotten a lot cooler. Look, this is like the only thatch we could find at the moment, and it's like it's a little too tiki hut. But we found some stuff that we're working on right now, and getting some custom weaving done to it. To um, it looks way more like hair. But as I was saying, I, I think I think this uh, little talk we're having here and. Uh, is kind of an interesting symptom of a larger thing going on in the discipline, or sort of rethinking the discipline at a really base level, um, in a way. I think we're in a moment that's like kind of post-discipline almost, without the kind of games that we're, at least in a way, even I was educated in, of formalism or um, typologies even, or uh, you know, from the school of, let's say, Colin Rowe, planometric thinking and into some other way of thinking about architecture, which is, um, I think, post almost medium specificity. So we're looking at a world where we can <coughs> radically rethink uh, what architecture can be and what um, even what representation means. And I, I really appreciate, I think, what Frank has been saying in, in a sort of taking this hard line, which I, I think is probably the right way to approach it in, in a way, like in Adolf Loos 
terms where where we are thinking about architecture as a physical act and we are just making stuff in the world and prototypes are the most important thing and it even better if we're making buildings. Um, but at the same time, we and we are interested in this kind of this kind of way of thinking about architecture, but we just don't have a lot of space to do that in. So um, what I'm going to show is some software that we've been using that was that helped work with this. This is sort of construction sequencing. It's all. Let's try to get through this quickly. We s we spend a lot of time in our in our studio um, playing, but uh, writing our own software, trying out experimenting with um, different ways of thinking about architecture, different ways of representing architecture or, or constructing architecture, and, and probably in ways that I would say follow a tradition of non-compositional practices of the avant-garde. So um, OK, it's kind of boring at this point, but I'll just jump right. I'm going to try to beat your time here. OK, so these are the sort of things that we do. This one um, is a kind of uh, catenary modeling. Let me see, I just I did one like right before. Hopefully this works. Okay. Um, where we can produce, let's uh, very simply, Catenaries, change the number of points. I'm going to change the rest length, bring it back down to. Okay. So, and then once we. This might get a little tricky because it's kind of close together here. Wait, I gotta get my. Okay. Um, and then we can surface these under certain conditions. So we can cr produce, like, let's say, maximum <coughs> face areas, minimum edge lengths, uh, different ways to triangulate it. Um, so we can re-triangulate these things. Let me, my monitor is a little smaller than the one I usually work on here. Um, within these services that we can then turn these also into um, physical, sp these are all spring models. So I mean, we looked at, uh, let's say, uh, some work that was done at by Axel Killing at MIT, and we 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 tweet we with catenary work, but we went in a different direction where we started working with minimal surfaces instead of grid shells, and um, and within this tr producing structural uh, structural surfaces with uh, triangulation. So if you um, let me turn these surfaces into physical into we call them particulating. So this and we can start to starts to act like let's say, a looser surface. We can even, like a physical surface, really, like a, a fabric. We can give it certain qualities of the, of the material, so it can become more like fabric or more like metal. Um, uh, start to give it structural tabs. Let me see if I can... And it will flatten everything for us and produce, um, and we can give it angles and whatnot, make it more. Um, give it edge, uh, edges as well, but I don't miss it. That button's right here. Maybe I can get to it. And it will also flatten it, number it, make it so we've made models with this. Um, it's fairly straightforward, um, and they work as under basic structural principles. I mean, we're not engineers, and so we have something like this. We do, do a series of them. We have a; these are just a couple. We have maybe four different little 
things. I mean, I think I have one already. Hmm. Okay, so this one is stacking <coughs> blocks. It calculates its own self weight. So um, for some reason, I really like into brown backgrounds right now. But the um, the blocks, you can give it size, you know, friction, density, mass. You can give it different ways of branching. And then it, it works off of um, principles like that you can start to grow. And it will calculate itself weight as it grows. So, um, and then, you know, for me, the m some of the most, let's say, fun, you can put wind, s wind on it and watch the whole thing fall apart, which is fun. You can make it so that the blocks turn red when they fall, when they're f in failure. I put a lot of wind on it, but <laughs> anyways. All right. Still going. I, I should stop that wind. Anyways, but um, <laughs> they're all gone. And so these are, th right now we're working on, like, for us, these projects turn into small, let's say, artist projects. Right now we're building one of these in uh, Newcastle with an artist at the at this Baltic Gallery with Tobias Putri. And we're doing um, something else at the Boyman's Museum with him as well. Um, and so they, they are small micro, they're like the pavilion you were talking about. They're not really strong architectural types. Their weakness, let's say, as, a, as an architectural category is something that we exploit or can play with. And... Um, and use it as a, as a mode of experimentation. The, the problem with all these things is probably, um, in a way, scalability of it or, you know, uh, these experiments, where do they go? And for, for us, we don't really, we're not really thinking that far in advance, frankly. We're just playing. And I think that freedom is a way for us to sort of try to rethink, let's say, disciplinarity even at this moment. So, okay. Done. Having been here just a year ago for a lecture, I will skip all the office projects and concentrate on research we have been doing in the last four years now at ETH in Zurich in the field of architectural and digital fabrication where we developed through these projects the, the idea, the concept, or it's a kind of a working title for us of digital materiality. Uh, digital materiality defining what happens when digital logics and physical hard material meet in a, in a prototype, in a piece of architecture. I, I will come back to this, uh, to this uh, concept later on while showing the project. Now, in order to start, uh, I will show you or introduce to you to the machine we have uh, installed at ETH now four years ago uh, because this machine is very is very important for us. It's kind of uh, it's it's kind of a manifesto. It's 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 then at the beginning of our of the, of the works you will see uh, n next. This is a, a very common uh, industrial robot. It's a KUKA. It's uh, it has been used still used in uh, automotive industry. Uh, throughout the last 20 years. So it's an old technology. Uh, I think right now there are several million <coughs> of such robots installed w working day and night uh, throughout the world. What makes make, made it interesting to us, uh, uh, it's interesting to us for several reasons. First of all, it's, it's large scale. So it's not a model building uh, machine. 
makes so it can move in a in a space uh, uh, of seven on this line linear track uh, by three by three meters. So it addresses the architectural scale, or at least the architectural scale of prefabrication that is known uh, since since 100 years to architecture. So what can be moved on on the street uh, by truck uh, is this size. The second reason is the price. So this machine is cheap because it's no high tech. It's a machine that uh, can be uh, purchased or uh, used by little or middle uh, uh, firms. Costs 100,000 euros. This is more or less something everybody, every construction company can afford. The third and most important reason is that this machine is completely generic. If you compare it with, uh, with uh, uh, milling machines or uh, cutting machines, all those machines are uh, defined or have been uh, 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 developed to perform one task in a, in a very efficient way. Uh, and this is good. But the, the, the consequence is that the specialized machines are more expensive because, of course, you produce, you make the whole engineering to sell 100, 200, maybe 1,000 pieces. Here, the engineering is done, has been done once, 20, 30 years ago, or even in the 50s when they, when they were invented. And since then, it's a tuning of the technology that still is very simple. It's all about having no failure at all. So this, those machines have to perform 24 hours a day because when they produce cars, they are, in a, as we have seen before, in a, in a huge uh, space, thousands of them, for example, for one car. And if one breaks down, the whole things break down. So the damage is, is quickly very, very uh, huge. Uh, we call this machine the PC of fabrication because when you get it, if you have no operating system, no OS, it does nothing. So it's generic. So it's up to you to invent, to invent the operating system, to invent the construction process. So this makes it uh, so interesting to us. Okay, now, now I will go through uh, four projects, four research projects uh, that, have been, that we have, have been developed with students at ETH. Uh, the first one is the, called the programmed wall. It was kind of a proof of concept when we got this machine because uh, uh, we, we just knew that the machine, that or, or we, we hoped that this machine could do uh, the most basic thing, stack, stack pieces. So nothing special. It's the thing uh, humans do since ever. And uh, the most stacked piece in architecture is the brick. The brick is a, is a highly <coughs> uh, technological element. It has been developed over 9,000 years. Uh, it's uh, available. You just make a phone call and you get thousands of them. It costs nothing. Uh, so it was the idea, kind of the ideal setup to test this, uh, if this, uh, this idea of additive fabrication <coughs> Uh, that we want to test would have some potential. I show this image because uh, we always start, we do this in the office in our practice, but we do this with students too, we always start physically. We never play, play around with software or program or script before having touched and tested the performance of the material and the material system because uh, the digital world is somehow uh, uh, can be, can be uh, uh, problematic. I mean, in the in the computer, in a CAD system, in an abstract system, you can put the brick in the air and it stays there. And this could lead to, to wrong uh, uh, kind of uh, assumptions on, on the whole system. If you do it physically, uh, normally you should know, but if you have forgotten it, if you do, f do it physically, if you push the, the, the brick too much, it falls down. So it learns you, it shows you some very simple, very basic uh, 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 kind of parameters of the, of the system you want to experiment with. And the next step is scripting. Uh, we work with students that have no, no uh, uh, scripting capability. When they come to us, of course, they, they have done math, they, they, they know about geometry and so on. 
but we, 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 uh, but we pretend that they, uh, from, them, from them, that they some very quickly start to program. And the trick uh, we, we uh, use to, to achieve this goal, because, uh, I mean, it's, they have a lot of other, thi other, other things to do. They do not, don't not want to enter into this uh, uh, foreign field, is that if we give them thousands of brick, they will never be able to design them by hand with CAD or pens, so they cannot draw it. So they are obliged to find a logic, to build a system and to find the logic. Of course, uh, the logic here is extremely simple, otherwise it wouldn't work with such kind, of with, 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 with the students in such a short time. A brick wall is a build algorithm. It's a visualized, build, materialized algorithm. So you take with stone, you put the next one uh, uh, beside of it, and when you have finished the row, you go to the next, so you move Z and you do it again. So it's two loop, two inter inter internecine loops. And everybody can uh, understand this very quickly. You, we give the, the skeleton and the students uh, uh, start to manipulate it and to find, uh, to try to trying to find out what the potential of this system is. On the physical side, uh, we take care of, uh, of uh, solving the problems. We build an end effector. This is the part that doesn't come with the robot, is the hand, the, the thing that does, that moves around, that, that manipulates matter. <coughs> and again, it looks like this. This was the first uh, uh, wall that was built <coughs> this way. It's still very slow, it's still very uh, inefficient, but it shows uh <coughs> uh, what the concept is. The concept is that the robot now is doing basically the same thing <coughs> as humans of the Mason would do but with another <coughs> slightly other performance. It's not faster, so the movement is slow, we can engineer it to make it faster, but the robot doesn't need to take measure, doesn't need any optical uh, uh, reference to, to build this algorithm. We humans do. So we need a very simple system that we can keep in mind and that uh, allows us to build in a, in, a, in a performative way, in an economical way, without measuring all the time. So those are the results coming out of a workshop for four weeks. Uh, and here we, we were astonished by, <coughs> by the, <coughs> the expression of those, of those walls, because on one hand they are very archaic, very physical, the, the material is playing a strong, very strong uh, role here. And on the other hand, things are happening that you have never seen in brick walls. And this is what we know since, uh, since uh, 20 years now. This was part of our education. This was the world in the computer, the logic of, of data, of programming, this, that suddenly here is, is overlapping uh, uh, with, with the, the digital artifact. The next project is, is kind of a follow-up of this. Uh, it addresses the, uh, the concept of, of resolution. Uh, it asks, uh, uh, the first experiment we took a brick <coughs> because we had the bricks. Now it, uh, the, 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 the observation behind this work is that the robot uh, can work with a piece that is hours at least 110 uh, kilograms and can do this day and night. And the uh, brick is designed this size, not because this size is nice or for some other reason, but this is the size a man, a human, can handle at least eight hours a day. If it would be 50% uh, larger, this wouldn't work anymore. So you would have, it wouldn't, would the whole system wouldn't be as performative. And the second observation is that resolution has a strong impact on architecture. On one side, on econom the economics of architecture, you see here, uh, so we, 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 we wanted to, we built with modules of uh, 40 centimeters by 40 by 40, 20 by 20 by 20, 10 by 10 by 10, and 5 by 5 by 5 centimeters, so four sizes. And here you see the difference, <coughs> that the same wall uh, takes, if you build it with the, with the, with the big stones, it takes you nine minutes to build with the robot, uh, the other one that is the same volume, the same uh, uh, mass, takes uh, 80 hours. So this is a dramatic difference. On the other hand, with the small module, you can uh, go much more into detail. 
you can do things you cannot do with the large module. Because large module is, is uh, too, uh, too rough. With the small module, you can uh, sculpt the surface, you can uh, make voids, you can uh, make ducts into the material, you can create the transparencies and so on. So the, uh, this is the material, so it was a uh, concrete block. This is the end effector. Again, it's a, I mean, I, w I won't talk about this, but it's an important part of the, of the game. And those are the results. Here you see the, 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 the question was how can you combine different elements and why would you do it <coughs> to create what? I'll just go through, I will not comment more on this. Because I'm it's getting late. Here another uh, 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 work that is a follow-up conceptually of the, other of, the, of, the, of the other two. It's working with uh, wood slats. Uh, basically, the process here is similar to the brick or to the stone. That's the, whole, the, the, the only difference is that in one direction, the module, the element, is variable. So we can adapt the length of the flat while producing. Here I show the result. And this, in these walls here, we started, uh, uh, it, it's pretty hard because we have this, we do this just in, in four weeks workshop, very intense workshops. But here the goal, the architectural goal was not just to, to build walls to addre address the surface, but this, but this element, the slats should, 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 should the, the whole performance show it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, structural effective, it's, uh, uh, the, the wall should, uh, can be insulated, so you can introduce uh, insulation material into them. And uh, the structure of the surface here uh, uh, is or acts as a, a water protection of the, of the wall by, by forwarding the water outside. This is the inside of the same wall, so there is this interconnection uh, of the two, the two uh, sides because it's the same element, but uh, the, the, the formal uh, appearance is completely different at the same time. This is another one, exploiting another technique, another system. This is the, the back side of the same, same thing. This is a further development of those systems. So in the beginning it was just about the wall. Here the, the, the topic of investigation is how do we uh, uh, do openings? If you have a system, you don't want to build a wall and then just cut out a window. We want to start with the opening with the window and build the wall around of it so that the window with the opening would be con constructively but also conceptual and architecturally part of the wall, so coming out of the wall. And last project, uh, this is completely on the other uh, side of the spectrum of additive fabrication. What you have seen now is, uh, is about modules that are uh, composed, that are stacked, that are glued together, that are nailed. And here it's uh, foam. You, Brett, were there when we, we, s we saw the results first time. Uh, so it's polyurethane foam. The robot has this nozzle on, on its hand. Uh, polyurethane foam is a two component material. When those ma uh, components meet, then uh, you, you get what you have in this, uh, this uh, glass here. Uh, uh, a liquid material first that starts to, to react and uh, expand in the first 30 seconds and then gets, uh, depending on the, the mixture, gets uh, solid. Here you have a short video showing how this uh, this works. The robot is, I mean, it just is exploiting uh, uh, two axes here, basically. It's just depositing this material on a predetermined path at a predetermined speed. And now you see uh, <coughs> the material starts to 
to expand hmm. and the form of those panels when we were producing acoustic elements for acoustic diffusion rises. <coughs> I go to the next slide showing the, the panel maybe uh, five minutes later. Uh, I've, I've shown the, the, the movie because the movie is very important. It's showing uh, the missing link between those two <coughs> images. On the left side you have the design data or what we are used to consider as being the design data as architects, geometry form. Uh, students were working uh, for uh, I think two weeks on this, uh, uh, this uh, geometry uh, before having the robot uh, in order to <coughs> test what, what's, what, what's coming out. And, uh, and in the first crit uh, that happened, that was, uh, was uh, uh, we did the day after, uh, they, they got those panels uh, for the first time was uh, amazing because they were all disappointed because they worked so long on those geometries. I mean, this is a very uh, simple banal. Other ones worked on super complex uh, uh, line grids and with a lot of concept in them. And what they, get, wh what they got was uh, looking completely dif different. And so we started there a discussion that then turned out in the, in the second part of the, of the semester to be very uh, 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 in interesting to us and to them on, on the role of geometry in architecture. Because uh, of course this geometry is important, is in there, but there are a lot of other uh, 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 parameters like time. So being the, the construction process, a process, having a the process a starting point and an end point and having uh, time, so time, that's the reason why I showed the, the short movie, uh, having the different steps, a sequence, all those uh, uh, things inform dramatically here much more than uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brick wall the final result. So mastering and understanding what happens in the production process gives you the tools to design, otherwise you are uh, you have no chance to to do a design, at least in this in this setup. So I show you a couple of <coughs> other. Those are very. I mean, they look. Uh, uh, we could discuss. We discussed a long time about uh, on the aesthetics, but uh, consider three three important things. First of, of all, uh, these shapes you could not do them otherwise with another process. So they're coming out of the process. Those processes have an, a kind of an, a constructive intelligence. What this student here is doing is he does a first uh, 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 step. So uh, for first he, he, draw, he draws a grid and secondly he passes on, he uh, shifts a bit and he passes in the grid a second time. So the first grid has always already taken shape, so it's, it's three-dimensional when he comes again with the liquid. Mm -hmm. So the liquid falls down into these holes and so you have the small connection uh, uh, thing and the, this, this kind of cushion into the growing into, the, into the, his lake. Mm -hmm. Secondly, those things are, even though they look uh, <coughs> very uh, random, they are technically reproducible. So if all the condition, of course it's very difficult because this material reacts a lot of uh, humidity, uh, temperature and so on, but if, if you keep it the same, you have the same result. I'll show a couple of other. Quicker. It's very wild. And here you would not believe that you can pre-produce it, but it's, it's a fact, we have tested it. It's really pretty much deterministic. So that, that's, that was it. And that now I just cycled through a couple of images to show, because uh, I have not shown uh, architecture now, to show <laughs> what happens or what's the potential if you take those experiments or those concept, architectural concept, and turn them into architecture. So if you change the scale. This is a winery uh, that was done with the te technology of the, of the brick, the first technology we have seen. We have designed together with uh, the office Beate Platzes in Flash in Switzerland.
And this is the installation we have designed for last year, uh, Biennale, Swiss Pavillon Biennale in Venice. This is the floor plan, those are the elements. This is a, a, a further robot we have built. <laughs> Here is building in Venice, and this is the result. This is our book that uh, shows all those projects. It was published last year for the Biennale. That was it. Thank you. Thank you.